Good afternoon. Welcome to the Women in Conflict panel. I'm honored to moderate. My name is Jane Harmon. I spent uh, decades in the United States Congress, and then I headed the, for, the, the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., first woman. And I am leading for the second time a delegation here uh, composed of senior women foreign policy officials, uh, former officials, and uh, three ambassadors are with me. I'm not sure they're all in the room. I can't see them. But uh, Ambassador Ann Patterson, who was our ambassador to um, uh, Pakistan and Egypt, and then the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, who was Under Secretary, Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs and had a variety of other assignments uh, for the State Department, and Ambassador Maureen Quinn, who was ambassador here to Qatar from 2001 to 2004. And it's been a very inspirational week. And I'm excited about moderating a panel, get ready, uh, with four women powerhouses. And you will hear from, from each of them. Let me just make a few introductory comments. The first is about uh, a dear friend, and I'm sure a dear friend of many of you, who died this week, Madeleine Albright. And just to say, I knew her for almost five decades. Uh, we were in a carpool together uh, as staffers to the United States Senate in the early 70s, where she worked for Senator Muskie, who later became Secretary of State, and I worked for Senator Tunney of California. We then worked together in the Carter White House uh, to remind Jimmy Carter established human rights as a plank of U.S. foreign policy. And in 1990, in the, in the decade of the 80s, we we're not in government, but we were in the same think tank. And then in 1992, I was elected to Congress for the first time, and she became the permanent representative for the United States to the UN, and the rest is history. And just a few more comments about her, because uh, she was singular, and her voice will s sincerely and seriously be missed on the global stage. Um, we were together on the Maidan in Ukraine, in Kyiv, Ukraine, in 2014, uh, we were there to observe the election uh, for president of Ukraine, and we were wandering around looking at the memorials to the uh, young people who died uh, in the cause of pushing out the uh, Yanukovych, the puppet of the Russian government, and then a fair and free election occurred. And I don't think it ever occurred to either one of us that we would see eight years later what is going on now. And so, of course, I'm wearing my, Af my, my Ukraine sympathy scarf. And uh, obviously, it is uh, just horrifying to see the images, uh, not just of, of women, but of children and of hospitals and of the rest of it in this uh, crazy uh, 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 aggression against an independent country. At any rate, those are my introductory comments. and. Now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, four women who have had and have uh, serious experience about women in combat zones from different perspectives and different countries. And what we have planned is each of them will speak briefly, five minutes or less, uh, about uh, what they do, uh, what experience they bring to this, and what are the challenges that they are facing at the moment uh, on this topic. And then we'll engage in questions up here and then we'll engage in questions with you. So starting out, uh, we have uh, an unbelievable woman, uh, Fauzia Kofi, who is the former chairperson of, of women, uh, civil society, and human rights, and, and the Human Rights Commission in Afghanistan. She's a, she, in the Afghan po <laughs> parliament, she's a former member of the Afghan peace negotiation in Doha, a very important role that she has played. Uh, following her, we have Dr. Amal uh, Almalki, who's the founding dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences uh, at uh, uh, Hamad bin uh, Khalifa University. Following her, we have Dr. Shireen Al-Feki, uh, who is the regional director of U.S. Uh, AIDS. And following her, we have Katrina Kat Fotuvat, who is the U.S. senior official to the Secretary of State in the Office of Global Women's Issues. So please, let's start with you, Fauzia. Please tell us your story. And uh, for those of you who have, read her, who have not read her, her biography, please tell us 
the beginning of your story. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're very interested to hear that part that you told me to mention specifically, which I will come to that um, in a minute. Um, but uh, before that, referring to the uh, theme of this um, uh, panel, uh, women role in conflicting in uh, transforming the conflict environment. Uh, of course, uh, who will know the importance of um, and understand the importance of women role in transforming the nature of conflict, but also the process uh, than the women of Afghanistan who have been through um, uh, over four decades of uh, uh, brutal conflict and it continued depression, uh, repression and aggression. Um, when we were negotiating for women to be in the peace process, to be engaged, because at the end of the day, we thought the peace process in Afghanistan is about women's rights. The peace pro process of Afghanistan, unlike many other peace process, uh, was about women's rights. There were women issues that were discussed there. So when we started in Afghanistan mobilizing voices around, um, uh, you know, women's participation in the negotiation, it was interesting to see not only uh, the male politician, um, some of the elites believe that there is no need for women to be in the negotiation, but also some of the women, because I think for us, we don't want to enter our, you know, the red zones. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone, I would say. We always think that, you know, this is not an area where women should get involved. Um, it's good that in many conflicts around the world, women are not the initiators and they are not part of the conflict, but they are the victim. If you look at all the figures and data in any conflict country, starting from Afghanistan to Yemen, Syria, now Ukraine, um, the awful war, if you look at the, the you know, the, 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 the the innocent people that get affected by this is not only about the losses of lives, the number of people that lose their lives, but also about the opportunities that are taken away from them. And women in that regard are the first victims. So we were uh, advocating for this. And I remember once we went to the former president uh, of Afghanistan's office, President Karzai, and we told him that, you know, the negotiations are going to start, you need to make sure that women are there, lobby on our behalf, etc. And then he said, well, we have not made really an important decision yet. Once we make the important decision, we will, in, uh, we will sh absolutely share it with you. But our thing was like, let women decide on this, because I know being in the negotiation, first of all, it's the most challenging job when you as a woman are, you are in the negotiation table. It is the most challenging job because you have to, on one hand, make sure that you represent your constituents, your people, your, the voices, your values that you represent. And secondly, you need to make sure that, as opposed to the rest of the room, that you're perfect, best version of yourself, so that nobody finger point at you, saying that, you know, well, woman, we didn't trust him, that's why. You have to really be your best version with all the challenges we we lobbied for woman inclusion, and when we were in the negotiation, there were four of us. Um, uh, when we were in the negotiation, we had to really be our best version and be in uh, according to all the standards that the male colleagues expect us. And the important thing is that we brought so much knowledge and so much diversity to the negotiation table. Initially, even Taliban will think that I was just sharing a story with one of the friends before uh, the panel starts. I was telling the, him that, you know, when we started the negotiation, we had a dinner organized by Qatar foreign minister for us with Taliban to kind of exchange. And we decided as women that we will share table. Like we don't sit in our woman corner, right? So we go and sit one of us in each table. And the table I was supposed to sh share with Taliban was the most kind of hardliner ones. A few of them are now minister. Ministers, one is the head of uh, administrative office of the Taliban. Uh, this gentleman in front of me, my colleague, is uh, laughing because he remembers the story. I went there and my hand was still in cast because I was shot like two weeks before that. And c culturally, when you are, you know, uh, when your hand is in cast or when you are in a wounded position or you need some support, culturally throughout our history, people have always helped us. And this is, I think, all over the world. But I went there and none of the table was able to like help me. And one of the Taliban guy, who is now the head of administrative board of Taliban said, this woman cannot sit in, the, in this table with us. 
because it's against Islam. I tried to ignore him because I felt so embarrassed in front of all the, you know, everybody, all the distinguishment, foreign minister of Qatar, all the diplomats, everybody, what to do now? He said, she cannot sit with us. And he made it louder and louder. And I was, I couldn't like handle the seat with my hand in cast. Those moments, only a woman will understand those pains. After a lot of struggles, I actually finally sat and he was making it louder like, it's against Islam. We will protect them with our blood. But Americans are using this woman to confront us. So she cannot sit here. And she was making, he was making it louder and louder. And I was talking to one of the softer Taliban who was sitting like near to me to just ignore him. But because he was making it so loud. And for me, it was a decision of either I continue to face him and be here because that's the uncomfortable zone, right? Or leave and leave forever. And I will not set a, road, uh, a good role model and example if I leave forever. So it was a challenging thing. I'm going to finish in a minute because I know you are to give um, the floor to others. So I was talking to this uh, Taliban who was sitting to me and I was asking him, how, how many children you have? How are you? Just to ignore this, this man. And I think I asked this man 10 times how many children he had. And each time he, he told me he had five children, but I still was like, okay, how are you? How many children you had? Just to ignore him. My mind was with him, but my, you know, I tried to make myself busy to accommodate myself into the space. After I finished, and of course this, this had a good ending because finally I offered him some kebab and he we tried to make normal the situation. Um, we never became friends, but we tried to make it normal. When I finished, I was so depressed and upset that I walked with my high heels so loudly not knowing that it can make a lot of noise, and this man remembered that. Everybody in the, in the hall was like, why are you making so much noise? I said, because any of my hills, I want them to like punch his mind because he gave me such a hard time. You know, this is an example of how much difficulty we undergo when we enter the no entry zone. But what happened at the end of like one year of negotiation, he was calling me by, by my name, like he was, Sister Kofi, Sister Kofi, whenever we had discussions, you really have to, as women, enter those places because you can only make difference when you talk with people that you don't share a common platform. Well, so impressive. I, I would just observe, I hope that man has daughters and he is raising them differently after meeting you, but please just give us 30 seconds on the beginning of your life because it's an amazing piece of your biography. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. Um, uh, well, for most of us as a woman, uh, our characters are being shaped and our beliefs and values are being shaped mainly because of our personal experience. And this is so true in my case as well as is uh, true with the, in the case of other women. So when I was born, because that's what a Congresswoman wants to hear, uh, my mother didn't want to have a, a girl because um, she as a woman has suffered so much like any woman in this world that she didn't want to have yet another woman to suffer as much as she suffered. So I was put outside um, uh, because nobody cared really. And I got sunburn in my face, um, uh, but I was rescued and um, I later on became my, daughter, my mother's favorite daughter. Um, and uh, my mother always started to believe in me because that's so important that we believe in our daughters. And she tell me, you will become something in the future. I never knew what that something mean, but I always believe that, you know, her belief will make me something. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Uh, Dr. Amal Amaki. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as an academic, I want to give an overview about women and uh, conflict zones uh, without focusing on an angle or uh, or anything, but if you have any questions for me, I would be happy to answer afterwards. So when we speak about the MENA region, um, uh, unlike the, uh, the systematic use of, of an umbrella uh, definition or description to refer to it, I believe that the MENA region is religiously and culturally very, very diverse. When we speak about Muslims, we, sp we speak about Shunnis, Shia, Shia, Druze, Yazidis. When we speak about Christians, we speak about Assyrians, Armenians, and Copts. And I think this is uh, exemplified by countries like Lebanon and Iraq. 
uh, it's a region with multiple political realities and ideologies, and you would see the discrepancies, especially in economies. I mentioned that to emphasize the intersectionality uh, of the lives of women in the MENA region, who live through multiple systems uh, or structures that predetermine their freedom and their access to rights. The MENA region has been pl uh, plagued uh, by some of the worst political and economic crises in recent history, and has become a context for political and militarization. So from bearing uh, the colonial legacies of the post-colonial world to the Palestine occupation, from the rise of political Islam to post-Arab Spring conflicts, and to the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the multiple levels of vulnerability that women already face in the MENA region has put them at the front lines uh, as conflicts and conflict zones, adding to the collective ordeal, of course, of combat, violence, killing, displacement, collapse of systems, whether educational systems, health systems, or economy. Added to that, sexual violence, rape, sex slavery, child marriages. So to contextualize women's ordeals, Arab region is challenged with some of the world's uh, lowest adult um, literacy rate with only 62.2% of the region, um, you know, aged 15 and above, uh, able to read and write. And that's far below the average, the world average of 76.4. The MENA paradox usually refers to uh, the discrepancy between uh, educational attainment, which is very high for women in the MENA region, and their participation in the labor force and economy and national economies, which is very low. I think it's um, in 2015, it was 27% women uh, as opposed to 77% men. So under conditions of war and conflict, Arab girls in schools and Arab women professionals are among the first to experience threat and loss. Not to forget refugees, of course. UN estimates estimates 13.5 million Syrian refugees since 2011. But also look at Libya, Yemen, Iraq, and the ongoing uh, conflict in Palestine. So when speaking about conflict, we cannot but uh, speak about the impact of COVID-19, right? Uh, as it has exacerbated injustices and equality, inequalities, exposed the uh, fault lines in our societies, especially racism and sexism. This global impact really need to be drilled down to focus on its impact on conflict zones that are most vulnerable already, uh, living in, in uh, fragile states, um, political, economic states, let it be, or let it be um, educational states, of course, cultural states, or displacement. So setbacks in women's rights and freedom have been recorded due to the pandemic. UN coined the shadow pandemic, of course, to refer to the violence against women and girls, um, especially um, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the increasing of violence against women brought to the surface the systematic discrimination that women are already faced in their own countries that intensify during upheavals and instabilities of any sort. One of the recent reports entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on Gender Equality in the Arab World assesses the disappropriate, uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on women. For example, in health care, they dominate the healthcare system. Um, they are nurses, uh, uh, midwives, health staff, and making them more vulnerable to contracting COVID and, and um, uh, uh, transferring it. Women receive limited or no sexual or reproductive services, not just during COVID, of course, intensified during COVID, but also during conflict zones. Mental and physiological stress, because women are the caregivers in our societies. And financially, women are uh, estimated to lose 700,000 jobs, of course, increasing the number of poverty and unemployment. Lack of access to internet is another case, of course, the digital divide, right? Uh, women uh, were uh, deprived of education because they were deprived of uh, access to internet. They were deprived of uh, access to communication and inform information, and sometimes access to uh, seek help from the aggressors that they were confined with. Uh, around um, half of the female population of 84 million are not connected to internet or has no access to mobile phones. Now I'm gonna stop here, but I would be more than happy to answer very more, more specific questions.
Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, mention that our next uh, speaker, uh, Shireen uh, Fecky, describes herself as a sexpert. It took me a minute to dissect that word, but her focus has been on sexual assault and harm against women uh, in general, and maybe you, you can correct that. But uh, this is an aspect of the problem that was just mentioned, uh, but that is um, hugely serious. Rape being weaponized as a, as a, as a part of war and, and things that women uniquely face. So we're glad you're here and you have your perspective on this. Many thanks, Congresswoman Harman, and assalamu alaikum, Sayyidati wa Sadati. Yes, I'm the Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa at UNAIDS, and as Congresswoman Harman said, my focus is sex. And I look at intimate life and how it reflects forces on a bigger stage, how it intersects with politics and economics and culture. As uh, Congresswoman Harman said, I've been described as a sexpert in the media, which I have to say is a pretty apt description of what I do and is sadly not a career option which my high school guidance counselor ever gave me. So I'm going to take us back to the mother of all documents, the mother of all agreements on women, peace, and security, UN Resolution 1325. And in 2000, it had the grand statements about the role of women in peacemaking and in peace building and in peacekeeping. And it also enjoined all parties in conflict to protect women against violence and conflict. Since 2000 and that landmark resolution, there has been an increasing focus on violence against women, gender-based violence against women in conflict, and rightly so, because if we look at the body of research that's assembled over the years, we see that around a fifth to about half of women in conflict settings will experience some form of sexual violence at the hands of a stranger. But what's interesting with this increasing focus is that we now realize that the greater exposure for women, the greater risk for women of gender-based violence is not on the front lines, but it's in the home front. Because we see that women in conflict settings are, are really very much more vulnerable to what we call intimate partner violence. So if we look globally, about one in three women will experience intimate partner from a husband or a boyfriend or a fiance, physical, sexual, uh, psychological, economic violence. And just to put that into practice, that means that basically two of us on this panel will have been on the receiving end of that violence. But if we look in conflict settings, that number goes up to 80%. And it's not rocket science. Why? I mean, there, what conflict does, as Amal said, and Alzia has you know, hands-on experience. What conflict does is it amplifies inequalities and it intensifies all the, all the problems that women who are either caught in the conflict or are fleeing a conflict face. And that includes lack of access to education, uh, lack of employment, which leads to poverty, which is also connected to risk behaviors, which is including substance abuse and sex work. And, uh, and it, it really, it, the culture of violence, the exposure to violence, uh, and shifting social norms and breakdown of social supports, all this is putting, women's, putting women in the front line. Now, uh, w when we think about sexual violence and conflict, we also think mainly about you know, male combatants and, and, and women and female civilians and you know the graphic rape and sexual exploitation and sex trafficking but of course there are subtler forms as well and I will mention some of this for example child marriage so what's interesting is if you look at the language in 1325 it talks about protecting women and girls and I've heard a lot of this language being used over the last two days but in reality what we want to do is empower women and girls to defend themselves and their families and communities against gender-based violence. I'll just talk a little bit about sex, if you don't mind. Uh, so 1325 is actually quite interesting because it's a little coy when it talks about what we would describe as sexual and reproductive health and rights. It talks about the special needs of women and girls, the particular needs. But really what we're talking about here is access to contraception, to safe abortion, 
to condoms and testing and treatment for HIV and STIs, for maternal and child care, and a whole host of issues in the spectrum of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Now, these are very difficult to secure. They're absolutely basic, but they're hard to get in a conflict, for example, when your maternity hospital is being bombed to smithereens, as in Mariupol in Ukraine. Or they're difficult to achieve when you're on the run, basically, when you're a refugee. One of the most, one of the most interesting experiences I had and what really brought this home to me is when I was talking to a group of Syrian refugee women, and they were really expressing their anguish at how they had been yanked out of the 21st century and thrown back into the 12th century. And they were not talking about the fact that they were now cooking over open fires or they were washing in rivers, but the fact that they did not have access to sanitary pads and were using towels, I mean, using rags. Right? I can tell you as a woman that the one time you do not want to be taking a trip down memory lane to the Middle Ages is when you're having your period. And so the good news about all this is that we now have, in, you know, we are now stepping up to the plate as an international community, whether it's the big ticket UN initiatives or it's the grassroots efforts to address these needs in sexual and gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we know what works. We know that if you're going to tackle this, then it has to actually get at the underlying forces, which are gender inequality and also patriarchy, and these are rooted in social norms. We know that these groups that are, you know, the groups that are successful in doing this are also working at multiple levels as individuals, they're working with families, and they're working with communities. And we also know that you have to include this full spectrum of women, and that includes young women and disabled women and trans and queer women, the full force here. And finally, just one final statement, is that we also know the evidence shows us that the most effective way of helping women is other women helping women. It's women-led, women-designed, for women beneficiaries. But the big problem here, and I'm just going to make one plea if you don't mind, is that the most effective groups to deliver this in fragile settings, in conflict settings, are women's rights organizations, women-led organizations. And yet the most recent analysis shows us that only about 0.2% of bilateral aid is going to these organizations. If we want to really beat back sexual and gender-based violence, we need to do better for these women. Thank you. So the good news is, at the U.S. State Department, we actually have a function uh, called Senior Official to the Secretary of State in the Office of Global Women's Issues. And uh, it would be very interesting for all of us, briefly, uh, to hear from you, Katrina Kat, uh, on what you're doing and what your challenges are. I will then ask about two questions, and we're going to the audience. Warning, I'm calling on a man first uh, for questions. So there. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And thank you to all my amazing co-panelists. Um, I am just humbled to be on this stage. And I really also want to thank the Emir and the government of Qatar for this amazing conference. Um, the forum has been wonderful. So what my office does, and I will start off by quoting the late, great Madeleine Albright as well. Um, we include women not because it's the right thing to do, because it's the smart thing to do. So what my office does is we integrate and make sure to include women in all foreign policy, all foreign assistance that the U.S. government does. So I will, I will uh, um, invoke Fauzia here to say, you know, as a very good friend to our office, our, our job and our obligation is to make sure the voices of amazing leaders like Fauzia Kufi are heard within all of our foreign policy discussions. So we often say nothing about them without them. So it is the goal of our office to make sure that women and girls are included in discussions regarding gender-based violence, regarding women, peace and security, and regarding women's economic empowerment. And these are not just pillars and silos and how they overlap, looking at the whole of the woman and how do we engage with men and boys. I'm so thrilled to see so many men in here today. Um, it, it, we make sure to include, and inclusion is just fundamental to the work that we do. We also take great pride in terms of conflict that the United States government in 2017 passed the Women, Peace, and Security Act, which was the institutionalization of 1325 into our own law. And what that law
Paul did was actually give us different aspects to look at and how are we doing meaningful inclusion of women and girls into conflict areas? How are we making sure to empower their leadership, their voices? How are we making sure to hold our own government accountable to those effects? So we just released our first report of our first year of implementation, and there are honestly a lot of gaps that we have to address. We also did a lot of great things in terms of increasing the amount of funding provided to women and girls, providing more localized approaches, again, looking at how do we provide organizational capacity and empowerment to women and girls already existing and working on the ground. Those voices are there, those leaders are there. It is our job to make sure to empower them and make sure that they are included. We just recently also, the Secretary of State just announced the doubling, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the 1% um, of, of foreign assistance is really geared towards women, 1%. We just doubled that to $2.6 billion is the new request for the U.S. government for women and girls. Um, and making sure that that is actually distributed and included in everything that we do, from climate change to um, the care economy and looking at different ways in which conflict is truly exacerbating um, impacts on women and girls. So again, the pandemic itself really revealed a lot of the gaps um, and how we can actually address them. We look at things, and I like to call them opportunities. There were opportunities that came up through this pandemic um, that we found new ways of making innovative ways to include women and girls in discussion. So I'm sure you're all very sick of using Zoom, but it was an amazing way to bring in local voices into the discussions that we are having, put them on a stage. So we see our role very much as we have very sharp elbows. So if we have a place at the table, how do we make sure to push our elbows out so that we can bring the voices of the women onto, onto the table as well? Thank you very much. I have two short questions, and I'll call on two of you to answer each of the questions so we get to the audience. Are you ready, folks? There is a microphone, and you will identify yourself and ask a question. Not a, don't, don't give a speech, ask a question, and we'll get to the end of this at 4.20 on time, uh, but I think this will be, it'll be very interesting for all of us to hear from you. So my first question, uh, we, we did hear that it's protecting women is one thing, uh, but the right way to do this is to empower women. So let me ask the first two women right here next to me, how do you do that? There's, let's uh, imagine a 10-year-old girl or a 15-year-old girl, how do you empower that uh, young person uh, to, to understand uh, what she can and must do uh, to make her place in the world? It becomes very difficult, especially to empower women um, when the priority is just war uh, and conflict. In a conflict environment, empowerment is not anymore a priority. It's basically, as you rightly said, it's about protection. It's about, you know, even ignoring. So um, uh, I think access to resources and making it, uh, mobilizing all the same-minded people to, um, especially civil society, political groups, media, everybody that is the stakeholder to, uh, to highlight the importance of women empowerment and especially being in the table because it, not only history and research shows but experience my own experience shows that if there are like at least experience of the last four decades of conflict that if there are women in the you know negotiation in the process on the table in the room in important decision making processes that process is more sustainable to address the need of the, the majority of the people including the victims of war, including, you know, the ethnic minorities, including the religious minorities. Thanks. And that's why, uh, I mean, it's not about politics only, because the male only talks the political piece. The political piece is not long lasting. We have to make it social also. We have to make it community peace. You rightly mentioned peace building. And peace building, we won't be able to achieve all of the stages, including peace building, peacemaking, you know, agreements without women because Thank it's sustainable. You. Totally agree. Uh, Dr. Amal. Uh, I would say the same. Um, I, I wouldn't answer how to um, empower a young uh, girl or a young woman. Uh, I would actually uh, say what would my responsibility as a grown-up woman uh, to do to uh, ensure that this young woman has her rights, right? Because it's not a matter of empowerment. It's a matter of access to basic rights sometimes. 
Uh, I want to take it a step further and speak about, now we all know that there are no crises that is gender neutral. So when it comes to crises and post-conflict resolutions, I think it's very imperative to have women in the table as planners, as decision makers, but also as implementers. So um, we need more women to be uh, able to inject the inclusivity that we need when we make decisions on, on that level. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, research really sh show um, the more number of uh, women in politics correlates with uh, the better decisions made um, um, in terms of inclusivity, in terms of sustainability. And secondly, we need to support civil society, women's civil society and women's groups, unfortunately, which are uh, vilified in our region. Oh, got it. Uh, next, sorry to rush, but I, I'm going to call on a few of you, so be ready. Uh, last question from me. Men are clearly uh, part of the problem that women face in conflict sex. <laughs> Let me try that again. Men are clearly part of the problem that women face in conflict settings. Can they be part of the solution as well? And we'll ask the second two panelists. Ah, uh, yes, how to work with men, the eternal question. I, I find it interesting that when we talk about, for example, sexual violence in conflict, we automatically think of women and girls, and rightly so, but we tend to forget that men and boys can also be victims. It's very interesting. Studies in South Sudan have shown that, for example, 30% of women and girls uh, have been experiencing sexual violence in, in the conflict there, but about 10% about of men and boys. And there aren't, in, historically, there haven't been the same resources available for, to address men. And what's really tricky here, and Katrina, you'll speak to this as well, is that conflict and the effects of conflict, particularly displacement, eat at the heart of how men define themselves and how women define men as well. And so remember I said about uh, you know, the increase of intimate partner violence in conflict settings against women. Well, part of the problem is that when men are in violent, in violent settings, they also take this violence to the home front. And what's really disturbing about this is that this becomes a forever war because Boys who have seen, have experienced violence themselves, have seen violence in the home, are more likely to grow up to become violent against their, oh, their own partners. And that is why in particular in Ukraine, I am very concerned when we see these pictures of millions of women fleeing and millions of men staying at home and fighting. What will happen when they come back together? So to speak to your point about how to solve this problem, it's, it, the important thing is to have men working with women. When I talked about how these really effective women's rights groups will actually work to change gender norms, well, you have to have men involved there too. And in particular, and perhaps we can talk about this, men very much define themselves, and this is based on research I have done and with colleagues in the Arab world, and. It replicates what happens globally. Men often define themselves economically. I am a man because I provide for my family. But if I'm displaced, uh, then how am I going to do that? And so you need to bring men to the table when you're having conversations with women and girls, and boys as well. And if you have that inclusivity, there are very interesting models of how you can bring men to the solution. I hate to cut you off, but I want to get to a few questions. Kat, do you have a final word on this, uh, men in, as part of the solution? Yeah, I think they have to be a part of the solution. I was actually quite touched um, to see the Amir yesterday give Roya Maboub an, an award. That was un incredibly touching I, for me. I meant and to mention that. That was wonderful. And having you know male mm -hmm. champions who are often in positions of power be the ones to bring women to the table to understand if there is going to be sustainable solutions, we have to have you know, the other 50% of the population at the table in order for lasting solutions to occur. I have two boys at home, so um, I know that they know that they need <laughs> women at the table, and certainly, you know, we want to make sure that we are including men and boys as well. Okay, now we are taking three questions, if there are three questions, starting with a man, and I don't, I can't see a microphone, but I know it's there. Uh, would a man, would a brave man like to ask a question? Identify yourself and ask your question. I can't see. Is there one? Come on now. Where is he? Yay. Okay, and we'll take them together and then we'll give final comments. Where is he? Two of them. Okay. And I, I can't see. Identify yourself, please. Okay. 
Nazar Abdel Gadir, the Executive Director of the Geneva Institute for Human Rights, asking about the NAP, uh, National Action Plan for 1325. Most of the people which you are working in the MENA region mainly, even they didn't know about this resolution, the 1325 resolution and the complementary uh, resolution. Plus, also, out of 194 countries all over the world, just 94, 98 countries, they did their own NAP. This is who is responsible for raising such kind of awareness within the women group, uh, first of all, and the human rights organizations and uh, civil society. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next question. I am Michael Liu. I'm a researcher based in Europe, but I'm originally coming from China. Um, my question is, um, in various conversations, I think we can see that there are women in leadership from time to time, not enough, but I also see a problem that can we transfer that leadership into a critical mass of a population. We can see more women, not only in the leadership, but also being a driving force in changing more modern um, works. So that's your question. How do we get to a critical mass? Last question. I hope there's a woman who wants to ask a question. Is there a woman somewhere? Cannot see. Okay. Hi, I'm Ruth Beitler from the United States Military Academy at West Point. So my question has to do also with 1325, what you perceive as its uh, greatest achievement and, of course, its uh, greatest pitfall. Okay. So we have Uyghurs, we have critical mass, and we have 1325 uh, strengths and weaknesses. And let's not have everybody answer every question, but let's go down the row somehow, starting with Kat, and see uh, what you would like to answer in any concluding remarks. Okay. Um, in terms of critical mass, I think, you know, the ways to make sure that we're getting to that point, I mean, our, our um, a former Chief Justice, our justice uh, to the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, said there will be enough women on the Supreme Court when all the Supreme Court justices <laughs> are women. Um, so I think critical mass is dependent on the context of the country, but certainly at least percentage-wise to what the population has. You want your um, leadership to reflect the population itself. Um, and we know that women work through networks and supporting each other, and so um, that is how women's movements have often occurred and been the most successful. Um, in terms of implementation of 1325, that is a really tough question. Um, I think in terms of um, the United States, um, we have, again, institutionalized 1325 through our Women, Peace, and Security Act. Um, our, so far, our greatest successes have been to make sure that women are brought into leadership positions during peace negotiations, um, advancing and making sure that their um, vulnerabilities and their rights are included in peace negotiations. I'm thinking of um, countries like Colombia, um, making sure that as we, if, uh, you know, countries have any part in assisting with peace negotiations, we are bringing people like Fauzia to the table. Um, in terms of gaps, um, I think, Resourcing, 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 resourcing. I think we need, need to make sure, you know, as um, defense spending goes up, we have not seen that same um, rise in spending on making sure that um, women, peace, and security and inclusion of women are actually included as well. Shireen? Um, just speaking about how getting to critical mass, I think one of the issues that we have, particularly in our region, is about silos, basically. That civil society, particularly women's rights groups, are often, you know, they do women's work, right, women's issues. But we need to generalize this. And in order to generalize it, to bring it, to weave it into the broader fabric of development so that it's not just in its silo, we also have to educate men that gender is not just women. It's also men and boys. So it's very critical. And I would say, ultimately, I'm not hugely optimistic about doing this anytime soon. So I think, actually, the education piece is very key about how we're teaching, particularly in MENA, our young, our young men and our young women, real gender equality in all spheres of life. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amal. I would reiterate and say that to build a critical mass, you need um, a huge number of women in political and leadership positions and in politics. And you do that through gender quotas. Simple to say the truth, especially in our part of the world. Gender quotas are, is the, the main uh, tool that enabled women to be, um, to be in parliament, uh, women parliamentarian or, or in politics. Uh, connected women, and uh, of course 50% is what I want, or you know, what we should be calling for, not 10 or 20 or 30. But anyhow, and connecting a woman in politics and leadership positions with grassroots movements, the women uh, associations and women groups who are uh, better 
best representative of uh, the multi uh, multiversity, uh, multi, uh, yes, um, the multiple voices of women and the intersectionality of women's uh, issues. Uh, and this would enable us to uh, go away a bit from the token representation that we see in the Arab world of one or two women in politics. Thank you. Fauzia. Um, well, uh, I hope next time, um, inshallah, we will have uh, some men uh, in the panel when we talk about uh, transforming, uh, you know, women rule in transforming conflict environment. Uh, because I agree absolutely, we talk with the same audience, the same people, the same messages. Um, and when I, when I say about, you know, entering the no entry zone, this is where we want to like bring also men out of their comfort zone to talk about not only women to talk about the conflict and peace, but also men to talk about woman inclusion in that, the importance of woman inclusion. About um, a woman, uh, you know, masses, empowering the masses, uh, I have first hand experience. I mean, um, after we came to politics, a lot of younger generation in Afghanistan actually ran for parliament. As soon as they were 50, 25, because that was the age that uh, was constitutionalized for people to make them eligible to run, as soon as they were uh, 25, they will run for parliament, um, which was good because you need to really increase access to resources. As uh, Dr. Amalek mentioned, in our part of the world, access, and I think it's a global phenomenon, access to resources is not equal. In addition to that, you add securities uh, and social challenges. So you need to give them access to resources, pr provisionals in the laws that will give them access, uh, um, equal access. Um, uh, if you have more women in politics and in leadership and in decision-making uh, uh, bodies, they will pave the way for the others. Because it's like a you know, vicious circle. If you have more women in politics, that means they will empower uh, the next generation. They will make laws and policies woman-friendly and pave the way for others. You need to set good role models also. And that's why the job of women who are in politics is so important and so uh, critical because they have to really set, not only do their job, but pave the way and set example for the rest of the next generation right. to come. So as a, as a woman who served nine terms in the United States Congress, I totally agree with that. And let me just close with two very short Madeleine Albright stories. The first is in Beijing in, I think it was 1997, when she was the Secretary, let me th think about this, she was the Secretary of State and Hillary Clinton was the First Lady and they came to Beijing to the Women's Conference. I was there, there was a congressional delegation of four people, three women and a man, one brave man, and that was when Hillary Clinton said the iconic words, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And that has endured for the decades, and it was an extraordinary thing that she did. The second story is uh, that, as you know, Madeleine Albright was the first woman to be U.S. Secretary of State. Condi Rice was the second woman to be U.S. Secretary of State. Hillary Clinton was the third woman to be U.S. Secretary of State. And Madeleine told this story of one of her grandchildren calling her by some very funny grandma name that she had and saying, Grandma, could a man be Secretary of State? Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists.